Tiff, uh, real pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, like I was telling you before recording, like uh, this podcast, a little bit of like a selfish endeavor for me to like get friends and learn from them, you know, and an excuse to catch up, uh, obviously. Um, you know, we first met uh, while you're working at L'Oréal and then you've since moved on. You've become a career coach and strategist. And uh, I follow you online and you have a, a lot of brilliant insights. And maybe I, I guess the first question to ask you is what led you to wanting to start a career in, in coaching people's careers? Yeah, I love that question, Nectar. And also, thank you so much for having me today. It's so great to connect with you like this. So what really started it, I would say it was actually very much inspired by my corporate career, because if you were to ask me the part that I love most about my corporate work outside of my more marketing oriented career path, it really was the people aspect. I loved growing and coaching and developing my teams to succeed. That was the part that always lit me up inside, was the most motivating for me, and was the thing that if you asked anyone that I worked with would really attest to the, the type of impact and, and inspiration I was creating for those around me. So in a way, it almost felt like a natural extension in hindsight now, looking back, that this was sort of the next chapter of my career and officially becoming a career strategy coach and helping to do that on a much broader global scale. Yeah. Was it a hard, was it a hard call? Like I'm going into maybe a little bit the inception story. Like I've, I've never kind of asked you this question, right? Like when you made the call of like, Hey, like have a super safe job at L'Oreal, you're getting promoted like every other week it felt like. <laughs> and then to say, Hey, I'm going to like, forego all this time and then kind of go venture out on my own was it uh yeah curious what went went on in your head what was the conversation you know in the around the dining room table with your family like that, that led you to say hey okay i'm gonna jump in with both feet yeah a hundred percent i mean it was a it was a scary decision it was something that i i didn't take lightly and you know to be very transparent i started it off more as a side hustle so it wasn't a cut off cold turkey type of approach where I, I quit my job and then just went all in on this at the beginning. Uh, you know, luckily in my case, the initiation of my, my coaching business and my content creation around that really started around one of my maternity leaves. So compared to a prior maternity leave that I guess you could say was more of a classical maternity leave, really soaking it all up and, you know, enjoying every moment, this particular maternity leave was very different because I had this this longing urge that I didn't realize was as prominent until I went on to that maternity leave. And the feeling was just growing and growing inside of me that I almost had this little voice nectar that was telling me, you know, you, you owe it to yourself to give it a shot. You owe it to yourself to try bet on yourself. Now's the time. And I, I guess I kind of had the mindset where, you know, I got nothing to lose. I may as well give it a shot. And so in my particular case, I, I almost leveraged, you know, that maternity leave, of course, to spend time with my family and my newborn, but I, I built up a level of discipline I didn't really know I even had in me that helped me get this off the ground. And I was able to kind of balance that over that year time frame, uh, build up a lot of the foundational elements so that when it did come time to really go all in on my business, which was about a year later, that's when I officially decided to walk away from my corporate job that I had been in for over 13 years. It was a huge part of my life. Um, I felt more ready to make that call. If for me, there were a lot of different elements that, that came into that decision. A lot of it was personal driven. Uh, obviously with the pandemic, it changed a lot of things and my perspective on what work should and could look like for me. And I got a taste very quickly in that, that first year of initiation of my business of what was possible and the type of impact I can really have on a much bigger scale. And so it made the decision to officially go all in uh, a lot easier in that way. It was definitely still, you know, uh, a, a, a big, a big shift, I will say, going from the corporate world uh, for that amount of time into an entrepreneurship world. Uh, but it was something that I felt ready for more than ever. And I have to thank a lot of my my corporate experience because it equipped me really well on the business side of things, the financial side of things, the that that entrepreneurial spirit that was a big part of my corporate job anyways. So there were a lot of facets that I'm really grateful for that helped facilitate that transition for when I went all in in the business. Yeah, like to use, you know, startup parlance, it's like you had a little bit of product market fit, you knew you can do it. 
uh, before, you know, jumping in with both feet. Um, yeah. So give us a sense maybe today um, of what it means to be a career coach. So it's like, um, you know, the types of service that you're offering. And then I want to I pick your brain on, um, on the career advice, the, you know, the actual content you provide and, uh, and uh, insights you're giving to, to the people you're coaching. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a, a lot of different types of career coaches out there. I mean, I built up a really beautiful network of coaches in this space. And I will tell you, I think that's one of the things that really pleasantly surprised me in becoming a career strategy coach is just how supportive this space is, whether on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on TikTok. I mean, it is there is room for everyone. And I think that's a really important learning for anyone looking to embark in entrepreneurship, where if you're getting that, that self-doubt kicking in that, you know, there's already people in this space, you know, does my voice really matter? Trust me, there is space for you. You need to make that space and create it, but there absolutely is. And that was one of the big insights I gained in, in becoming a career strategy coach in the first place. And, you know, what it means to be a career coach or career strategy coach, uh, it could mean different things. I think the real distinguishing factor that I bring Nectar is the fact that I'm really, I'm really leveraging my own experiences from being within that corporate path. And a lot of the insights that I, I'm happy to share in a few moments with you really transcend across industries. It's not even just about corporate career paths. It's a lot around navigating the working world. And I'd say, you know, compared to some other career coaches that come more from a recruitment or HR lens. I'm really coming from that employee side of having navigated it all firsthand. And so there's a real level of relatability and empathy and understanding that I bring in my coaching services, programs, and content that really hit home because I, I've been there myself. And, and it helps bring a level of authenticity that I, I really try to weave through everything that I do. So for me, what it means to be a career strategy coach is, is giving back and paying it forward to this incredible generation of talent, whether younger in their careers, mid-stage, later stage, and really avoiding the blind spots that will stand in the way of fast-tracking your progression, whatever that looks like for you. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. I find it's almost like a journey of self-discovery, right? That people are on mm -hmm. and and having having access to people that have been there before, right? So it's like, you know, talk a little bit about your your business in, uh, after, but I'd be curious to hear about how, like, on the one side, people that are looking for this type of help and support, uh, and then also from your end, being able to, to find these people, right? Finding the needle in the haystack across a wide swath well actually well, well maybe i'll well, we'll get right into it in terms of like how you grow your business right so like obviously you use predominantly yeah. social media obviously your website um what's yeah. been the key to success for you like the best way to reach out find folks that would benefit from from what you're providing yeah yeah it's such a good question nectar I would say, yes, for me, social media has definitely been my primary path for, for lead generation and building up my audiences. Uh, it's all organic, by the way. I don't do any paid advertising, maybe one day, but for now, it's been all through organic growth. Um, and what I did at the very outset, that's been a, a theme I've carried through as I grew my audiences across platforms, is really get clear on, on what my mission is and what my pillars are. Of, of content and, and expertise are. And I think that's really helped me to be very focused and disciplined in my approach and what the end delivery looks like for my audience. And kind of similar to what I said a little bit before, having gone through this experience firsthand in my corporate, ex in my corporate world, the, the beauty that I bring to it is not just tips and strategies and advice to fast track your growth, secure new jobs, you know, bring home those salary raises and all of those tangible wins, but also a lot on the day to day nuances that no one teaches us. I mean, that's been a big philosophy for me in, in what I adopt in, in my content and building my audiences is all the things that school never really prepares us for and all the things that no one really talks about or talks about very practically, right? I mean, it's one thing to maybe look something up on Google, but to really know how does that actually apply to you? Like, what does that actually mean in my particular context? That's really, I'd say the, 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 recipe that I bring to the table that has helped me grow quite significantly over the last two years. Um, and to answer your other part of your question, yes, now I'm, I'm quite prominent on Instagram, TikTok, and, and growing on LinkedIn as well. But I started primarily on Instagram. I wanted to start with one particular platform, really master it, and gain a lot of insights there. And I particularly cho chose Instagram at the time because of the engagement factor. 
as you probably gathered from me and what I shared at the beginning, I'm very big on people and relationships and connecting. And Instagram is an incredible platform for that. So I knew that that would be probably the most insightful for me, not just in the content delivery, but also in what I can gain and in insights from my audience as I, as I grew uh, further on. Um, and it was only really as of 2021 that I started really branching out into TikTok more actively and on LinkedIn more actively as well. So the kind of cool thing is that each of these platforms, although organic in their own right, have very different perspectives, approaches, what works on one doesn't really work on another. So it's given me a lot of insights too on how I should be showing up on each of those respective platforms. And even the audience that I'm connecting with on these platforms are very different. Um, so, you know, LinkedIn, obviously, it's kind of a a more professional oriented type of environment that maybe already is in the consideration set of those who are following me. Whereas on TikTok or Instagram, there's kind of that initial education of, you know, why even career strategy coaching is important and why that's needed. So I hope that answers the question, but feel free if you want me to further clarify anything as well. No, it's great. It's great. I find like, I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but you know, this whole concept of like the creator economy, like mm -hmm. you create good content and then you're making, you know, like you're living, you're, you know, you're feeding your family as a result of that. Right. So it's like, I find it sometimes yeah. gets missed in the stories of like, oh, social media is bad. It's like, actually it lets a lot of people, you know, like live their dreams and uh, create value for people as well. Right. So I think it's a side of the story I find you're bringing that's, that's insightful. And then in terms of like the actual advice and insights you're providing, uh, you're really helping people in their careers, right? In seminal moments too, right? Where they're uncertain, they're yeah. looking for advice and from people that have been there. When you're on that, like, let's say that first call, what's the pattern recognition that you have so far? You're like, oh, okay, like, let's say the, the top three things or top three, like, challenges people are facing when they come, you know, like during this, like, initial, let's say, discovery call. Like, I don't want to say career yeah. mistakes, but more, I want to say, like, crossroads people are facing. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful question because there are some, some key themes that I've noticed. Um, and I'd say it, it comes down to a few key things. The first is taking overall a more passive approach in career. Uh, that's a big one. And that, that could translate into several different things, right? Maybe it's letting, you know, self-doubt or imposter syndrome stand in your way. Uh, maybe it's not knowing how to really advocate for yourself properly. Maybe it's, relying too much on other people like your boss to spearhead career conversations or salary conversations. Um, so th that's definitely kind of one facet of having more of that passive approach that I see quite commonly. Um, another I would say is also communication. And I would say, Nectar, like this is one of the most underrated things that can make or break someone's career progression. Like I've seen it time and time again with my clients of when you start mastering your communication, that's where the magic really happens. And so, you know, whether that's advocating for yourself or how you're building relationships, whether it's, you know, really having the right and needed types of conversations or networking effectively. Uh, and even like I said before, in the day-to-day -day situations, those micro moments might feel very small, but they add up over time. And without the proper kind of communication skills, it can really backfire and, and create more harm than good. Um, so that's definitely another theme that I've seen. Um, and I, the, the third one, I'll kind of buckle it together, although it could probably broken out a little bit more, is, is anything from kind of the clarity piece or feeling a little bit uncertain as to what you want next, uh, what steps need to be taken to get there, or sometimes just feeling really trapped even in an environment that's no longer serving you. And that could be maybe a toxic work environment, dealing with a toxic boss, or maybe being in a role that you signed up for that ends up being nothing close to what you signed up for, or just a lot of challenges along the way that could directly impact someone's well-being. And, and that's a huge focus for me, especially in my coaching, because I often say, you know, if if you're not taking care of your well-being, there's there's no possible way that you can show up as your best self in your career or your personal life. It's going to have a, a bad ripple effect. So those are definitely a lot of the themes that I see uh, from the, the clients that I work with or people that come into my following that I connect with and speak with on a regular basis. Yeah, I love those, you know, those, those three themes you mentioned. And like, obviously, they come with, you know, hard, hard, hard fought experience. Um, and, yeah. you know, we'll talk about your book a bit. Actually, what, the title of your book is Things I Should Have Known, right? Is that is stuff? It, very close. It's stuff I wish I knew earlier. And then the sub, the subtitle is Living Your Career Potential. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess to throw the question to you, what will be the stuff that you wish you knew earlier in career, maybe yeah. along those three themes, but other, uh, maybe other, uh, other areas we can explore as well. I'd be curious is like going back to those hard fought lessons, you know, have the scars to prove it. I'm curious is like mm-hmm. for your own, in, you know, introspection, the, the lessons that you learned along the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, where do I start? But you know, you, you bring up a good point too, just before I get into the, what I learned earlier or what I wish I would have learned earlier, because that that's a huge inspiration as to why I became a career strategy coach so that others don't have to make those same struggles or mistakes on their own. They can learn from me and cut through a lot of that clutter guesswork, right? Uh, the trial and error route can be very frustrating uh, when you're doing that on your own. And so I'll, I'll share the things that come really top of mind for me, Nectar, and what I wish I knew earlier, and also what I share more in my book. Uh, the first is not comparing yourself to other people. I can tell you I used to be very guilty of that. And it's it's very human. I think we all do it from time to time, and that could apply in entrepreneurship Uh, maybe even especially in entrepreneurship, when you are dealing with a lot of that initial self-doubt of getting something off the ground, but not comparing yourself to others is something I really wish I would have realized sooner. And it's something I I love coaching on because the moment you take that precious energy and orient towards you and your path and what you want, you can become so much more focused on what it takes to get there because focusing on others in a negative way is only going to distract you from keeping your eye on the prize. Now there's ways of comparing to others in a way that creates more curiosity and inspiration, of course, and that, you know, Hey, if they can do it, so can I like that, that is a lot more productive than the negative trap of comparing yourself and then leading to a vicious cycle of self-doubt and negative mindset. So that's definitely one thing that stands out. I would say another key learning that I wish I knew earlier is the importance of advocating for yourself. And I'd say this is particularly prominent nectar amongst professional women, where it could be part of our upbringing, culture, background, that we don't advocate for ourselves enough. And that could be in like the day-to-day situations, promotion conversations, salary negotiations, and all of that. Um, but it, it, it leaves it leaves a lot to be to be had and and received when you are not advocating for yourself effectively. And I didn't do that at the beginning of my career. I really just thought my work would speak for itself. And that was it. Um, And that was definitely a a key mistake that uh, I never want anyone falling into the trap of. There's other intentional efforts that need to happen. So that's definitely a big one as well. Uh, Another one I would say is really recognizing the importance of relationships, right? I mean, we talk a lot about networking and again, in the entrepreneurial world too, and just like us, Nectar, connecting today and, you know, the relationships that we have have brought us together for today's segment. Uh, you know, it's so important to create really meaningful relationships. And I know networking can sometimes be an icky word for some people, but there's so much positivity that can come out of that, whether actively job searching in your job as you're growing in your career. And it's something that's helped me tremendously in fast tracking my own growth and what I coach on specifically so others can do the same. Um, but you don't really know that kind of going into your career and how to do it in a way that's going to set you up for the most success. So that was definitely something I wish I would have known earlier as well. I think those would definitely be my top three. Yeah, I was going to say, I could definitely relate to them. Like, uh, on the, <clears throat> the first one made me think of like, you know, the Buddhist principle of like, you know, like if you don't want anything, uh, then that's true happiness. And I find like, I've, you know, I've also been guilty of like, Hey, look at this person that got promoted or a peer that's doing really, really well. Or another, like another yeah. company that's like, Oh, look at them. They're, they just hired X people. And you don't always know what's going on inside. And yeah, it goes back to like, if you really want to improve and get better, just focus on yourself. I think that's always like, I think that's a very, very good insight. Uh, 100%. Right. Look at yourself. I often say, you know, use your own self as your benchmark. Like, are you progressing versus where you were last week, last month, last year? Like that is a much more telltale sign of your success than focusing that energy elsewhere. Yeah. And then that second piece of advocating for yourself and in particular amongst women, like, I've, uh, you know, I, uh, I've seen that as well, you know, like in it with, you know, women I've worked with or they're, they're very good at the job, but not always, um, uh, like you said, it goes back to the notion of communication, like communicating their wins, which when you're working at a job, yeah. you kind of have to play politics a little bit, even though it's not like, oh, yeah. maybe seem like a dirty word, but you do have to promote yourself and what you're doing. It's mm-hmm. kind of part of it when, when, uh, even really, it doesn't matter if you're an employee or an employer, you kind of have to do it in both, in both instances, but particularly I think when you're an employee, 
uh, it could be just in sharing credit, right, of the team and people you've worked with, but you need to be able to, to communicate. So I think that's, that's definitely a key piece. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, the relationship part, um, I think it often gets spoken enough about, right? Like how, yes, there's professional lives, personal lives. Like when there's, you know, like there's not necessarily like friendships are always not always made at work, but you do develop uh, professional relationships with people, right? And on a friendly basis. And these can last, you know, years, uh, decades, right? So it's like being able to foster them and build these these long-term relationships is, is really key, right? So it's like, mm. and I find that's a little bit of what we've lost with the pandemic is work's become a little bit more transactional just because like now we're talking over a screen and yeah. it's harder to build a, a relationship. I'm not saying it's all negative. I'm not like, a, you know, I'm not one a, bo- a boomer to, hey, we, we need to go back to the office, but there needs to be a balance, I find, particularly when it comes to the human side of like, hey, building relationship with your team and other yeah. people. So I'm, I'm on, on the pandemic front, has it evolved a little bit because you started before? Has it evolved a little bit of your practice? Obviously, you're doing it remotely, uh, which allows you to be able to obviously be much more flexible. But in terms of the career advice, has it changed a bit? Yeah, no, it, it's so funny because it ended up being quite timely with the onset of the pandemic, just coincidentally. I mean, I... I started my business around March of 2020, so it was exactly when it was hitting. Um, And to your point, luckily, I mean, my business is an online-driven business, so I'm able to work remotely. I work with global clients from all around the world, so that's been really amazing to connect with people from, you know, Dubai, the Philippines, Singapore, Kenya, you know, South America, and all of that. So, I mean, it's pretty exceptional when you think how, you know, to your point about social media, seeming like a bad thing. I mean, it's great in so many ways and, and allowing me to connect with people I otherwise would never have had a chance to meet. Um, but in terms of how things have maybe evolved, yeah, for sure. There's a, there's definitely some ebbs and flows in terms of the remote work now, you know, remote hybrid work now balancing sometimes that return into the office, which is not always everyone's cup of tea when they've gotten used to working from home. But then on the flip side, there's some people who really love that social aspect of being in an office. So there's definitely things that I love supporting my clients on and navigating those kinds of nuances. Um, And I'd say there's a lot of changes happening on the employer side as well, right? I mean, there's been a lot of changeover. I mean, more and more talk about it being an employee's market right now. Um, employees are, are smarter. They're more demanding in what they want and what they're willing to stand for and not accept anymore, especially on the well-being front. So it's it's definitely shifted things. I mean, anything from the great resignation and a lot of people leaving their jobs, a lot of people not even going back to work right away. So there's, there's certainly adjustments that uh, I've, I've really loved supporting on because, again, the heart of what I do is helping you take full control of your career success. And that can look different for everybody. Uh, but I want whoever I'm, I'm working with and supporting in that way to make sure that they feel like they're on the right path for them, whether that is you know navigating this pandemic and having survived through massive layoffs or maybe being part of company layoffs and trying to get back into the workforce, or maybe just being in a very lucky company that wasn't as affected and wanting to still really shine and thrive there. So there's, there's been a lot of that nectar. Um, and I think that's created a lot of fun and diversity in, in my approach and how I'm able to bring a lot of transversal methods and supporting on all of that. Yeah. It's like, you know, what's the, the topic called? Like the great resignation, right? Like so people yes. that are uncertain and like not, not sure if they want to continue working in the job or just in their career path. Um, this may be a, a you know, question from the field. Um, you have so much exposure to, you know, people's careers and what they, their, you know, their, their desires, what they're looking for in an employer. And that's such relevant information for employers, right? So it's like almost would you would you be have you ever considered building like an HR practice for companies to say, hey, here's what I've learned from, you know, like X hundred, you know, sessions, you know, and like, you know, becoming like instead of B2C, but a B2B business also. I know it's a yeah. misfocus maybe on your mission, but I don't know. I'm just throwing the question out there. Oh no, it's it's a great question, Nectar. And not a misfocus at all. It's actually something I've thought about quite a bit. I'd say even especially more as of this year. I've always loved the idea of having a B2B leg to my business, uh, more on especially the employee management side of things, improving employee retention, uh, because you're absolutely right. I've gained so many incredible insights of what, you know, what makes them tick, what, you know, you want to do versus not do to really better motivate and engage and enable your employees. 
Uh, and I would say, especially even amongst like a younger generation of talent, because it's a very different dynamic than older generations. And a lot of organizations do have some older management kind of leading that way forward. So there's there's definitely a lot of room for optimization there um, and, and some key themes. But I would say a big one is the importance of well-being and mental health. Like that is huge. Uh, I think if the pandemic has taught us anything is, well, one, the toll that the pandemic has had on many people in that regard. Um, also how some companies haven't necessarily adapted in the best way in that regard and the need for really strong best practices in that, in that nature, uh, you know, just piling on work when people are let go and expecting other people to take on that slack. It, it, it takes a really big toll and, and that's a, a huge opportunity in terms of, of really bringing in the right kind of talent and retaining them because as an employer, it's, it's costly, right? When you're training new employees, you don't want them walking out of the door in the first 90 days. And yet I see it time and time again, how many people, even in my following who are talking to me on a regular basis, how, you know, they just started in the job that they were really excited about. And it's been a nightmare because the onboarding has been non-existent or, you know, there's no real policies or procedures that are helping them and they feel completely lost. That can be really destabilizing, especially for a young professional who's starting out excited about their career and then feeling totally alone in how to navigate that. Yeah, I can imagine, you know, like during sessions, you smacking your forehead saying, oh, like these companies have like sometimes self-inflicted wounds where it's like, oh, if you just, you know, follow, you know, like simple best practices. Uh, so going back to the, the B2B side, so it's like almost, yeah, building like a, almost like a consulting arm to, to what you're doing. Um, yeah. Have you thought about more long-term? Like what's the vision? Like how grow, do you, do you want to grow it? Like hire people? Or do you want to stay independent, like solo and with the flexibility that that affords? Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. It's actually something I'm actively thinking about more and more now, Nectar. I always kind of thought coming into 2022, this was going to be the real like expansion year. Um, I'd say 2020 was more like the foundation. Uh, 2021 was a lot more like testing and learning and exploring new platforms. And now that I've kind of gotten that down, 2022 was my year to like really expand and accelerate in every every regard of the word. So the B2B exploration for sure is something that I'm, I'm actively considering. Um, and in terms of your question around what that future looks like is in terms of team and, and all the things of that, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I can definitely see the benefit of having more support in key areas of the business, something that I can delegate more of and allow me to focus in other areas that I do best. Um, that's something that I'd love to start implementing more of as this year. In terms of what the future holds, I mean, I think that's the exciting thing just because in the last two years alone, my business has evolved dramatically. And like, that's only been in two years. So I, it's hard for me to say, you know, what is it going to be in the next two years from now or the next five years? But I, I think so long as I stay true to my mission of of giving back and paying it forward to incredible, ambitious professionals. And whether that's one-to-one -one, through group coaching, through courses, or on the B2B route to also help organizations enable their employees most effectively, uh, I have a feeling that's going to really be at the heart of what I do moving forward whatever that ends up looking like. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Maybe a, a final question or two, like I want to talk about the book, right? So like the inspiration for the book, you know, like what you're hoping to achieve a little bit of sneak peek of, you know, the key, the key ideas in the book. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, this has been such an incredible project. And, you know, speaking of the importance of relationships, I, I always say this when I talk about the book, because I actually co-wrote this book and I co-wrote it with a fellow career coach who I met back in 2020. Funny enough, we were both selected as guest panelists at a university conference in Canada and we kept in touch. We really connected on the conference. He had already written a first book oriented more for soon to be grads. And he was working on his second book for young professionals, you know, the 20 to 30 year old range when you're starting out in your career, what you need to know, the stuff you wish you knew earlier. And so he reached out to me as one of his co-authors, which I immediately said yes to because probably for a lot of people, you know, writing a book is one of those things on a bucket list. It definitely was for me. And it it certainly wasn't something I envisioned doing that early on in my business. So I, I, I was so ecstatic because it was exactly in my lane of where my area of expertise lied. And the great thing with the book too, Nectar, is that we even partnered with three additional authors who are specialized in completely different fields outside of career. And so the book 
although, you know, stuff I wish I knew earlier, living your career potential is, is very career focused. There are several sections as well beyond just career when we talk about maybe finance, investing, you know, that buying your first home versus renting, uh, physical health, mental health, hard skills, soft skills. Uh, we we kind of coined it, you know, the adulting 101, uh, if you will, on everything you really need to know, because as a young professional, yes, career is a big part of your life, but there's a lot of other things that, you know, no one really teaches you. So I loved that premise of this book because it really leaves no stone unturned. And the fun part is that it's really anecdotal. You know, it's leveraging all of our different personal experiences, but also with, with methods and strategies that work to set you up for success in those different areas of your life. Um, and it's been an honor to be able to put that project together. And it's actually available now uh, for online purchase on Amazon and Indigo and Barnes and Noble. So it's it's so surreal to see it come to life after you know a year and a half of, in the making. Amazing, amazing. Congratulations. I'm going to definitely link the book in show notes. Uh, Tiff, uh, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. I learned so much. Like I, like I said, like I like this, this focus on career because it's not just, I think, not for people earlier in their careers. I think this is advice that's really evergreen for, for people that are anywhere in, in their careers. So I find yeah. it's very, very good uh, advice that you bring to the table. I guess final question would be if people want to reach out, connect, uh, what's the best way? Yeah. Oh, well, again, thank you so much, Nectar, for having me here. It's been so much fun. Uh, so the best way to connect with me, I would say uh, definitely you can check out my website, www.tiffanyhuman.com, uh, or feel free to follow me on my primary, primary social account. So Instagram at tiffany.human. Uh, you could follow me on LinkedIn as well, Tiffany Human Career Strategy Coach. Please don't be shy. Send me a message. I'd be happy to connect, especially if you tuned into today's podcast and uh, have any follow-up questions. Uh, or if you're more active on TikTok, talk uh my handle there as well as at tiffany.human so those are where i'm most active on a regular basis and i'd be so happy to chat more with you awesome tip thank you so much thank you